Section 16 of Black Experience in America, 18th through 20th Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hot Foot Hannibal by Charles W. Chestnut. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Black Experience in America, 18th through 20th Century. Hot Foot Hannibal. I hate you and despise you. I wish never to see you or speak to you again. Very well. I will take care that henceforth you have no opportunity to do either. These words, the first in the passionately vibrant tones of my sister-in-law, and the latter in the deeper and more restrained accents of an angry man, startled me from my nap. I had been dozing in my hammock on the front piazza, behind the honeysuckle vine. I had been faintly aware of a buzz of conversation in the parlor, but had not at all awakened to its import until these sentences fell, or, I might rather say, were hurled upon my ear. I presume the young people had either not seen me lying there, the Venetian blinds opening from the parlor windows upon the piazza were partly closed on account of the heat, or else in their excitement they had forgotten my proximity. I felt somewhat concerned. The young man, I had remarked, was proud, firm, jealous of the point of honor, and, from my observation of him, quite likely to resent to the bitter end what he deemed a slight or an injustice. The girl I knew was quite as high-spirited as young Murchison. I feared she was not so just, and hoped she would prove more yielding. I knew that her affections were strong and enduring, but that her temperament was capricious, and her sunniest moods easily overcast by some small cloud of jealousy or pique. I had never imagined, however, that she was capable of such intensity as was revealed by these few words of hers. As I say, I felt concerned. I had learned to like Malcolm Murchison, and had heartily consented to his marriage with my ward, for it was in that capacity that I had stood for a year or two to my wife's younger sister Mabel. The match, thus rudely broken off, had promised to be another link binding me to the kindly southern people among whom I had not long before taken up my residence. Young Murchison came out of the door, cleared the piazza in two strides, without seeming aware of my presence, and went off down the lane at a furious pace. A few moments later Mabel began playing the piano loudly, with a touch that indicated anger and pride and independence and a dash of exultation, as though she were really glad that she had driven away forever the young man whom the day before she had loved with all the ardor of a first passion. I hoped that time might heal the breach and bring the two young people together again. I told my wife what I had overheard. In return she gave me Mabel's version of the affair. I do not see how it can ever be settled, my wife said. It is something more than a mere lover's quarrel. It began, it is true, because she found fault with him for going to church with that hateful Branson girl, but before it ended there were things said that no woman of any spirit could stand. I am afraid it is all over between them. I was sorry to hear this. In spite of the very firm attitude taken by my wife and her sister, I still hoped that the quarrel would be made up within a day or two. Nevertheless, when a week had passed with no word from young Murchison, and with no sign of relenting on Mabel's part, I began to think myself mistaken. On a pleasant afternoon, about ten days after the rupture, old Julius drove the rockaway up to the piazza, and my wife, Mabel, and I took our seats for a drive to a neighbor's vineyard over on Lumberton Plank Road. "'Which way shall we go?' I asked. "'The short road or the long one?' "'I guess we had better take the short road,' answered my wife. "'We will get there sooner.' "'It's a mighty fine drive down by the big road, Miss Annie,' observed Julius. "'And it don't take much longer to get there.' "'No,' said my wife. 
I think we will go by the short road. There is a bay tree in blossom near the mineral spring, and I wish to get some of the flowers. I specs you'd find some bay trees along the big road, ma'am, suggested Julius. But I know about the flowers on the short road, and they are the ones I want. We drove down the lane to the highway, and soon struck into the short road leading past the mineral spring. Our route lay partly through a swamp, and on each side the dark, umbracious foliage, unbroken by any clearing, lent to the road solemnity, and to the air a refreshing coolness. About half a mile from the house, and about halfway to the mineral spring, we stopped at the tree of which my wife had spoken, and, reaching up to the low-hanging boughs, I gathered a dozen of the fragrant white flowers. When I resumed my seat in the rockaway, Julius started the mare. She went on for a few rods until we had reached the edge of a branch crossing the road, when she stopped short. "'Why did you stop, Julius?' I asked. "'I didn't, sir,' he replied. "'Twas the mare stop. Go on there, Lucy. What you mean for this foolishness?' Julius jerked the reins and applied the whip lightly, but the mare did not stir. "'Perhaps you had better get down and lead her,' I suggested. "'If you get her started, you can cross on the log and keep your feet dry.' Julius alighted, took hold of the bridle, and vainly essayed to make the mare move. She planted her feet with even more evident obstinacy. "'I don't know what to make of this,' I said. "'I have never known her to balk before. Have you, Julius?' "'No, sir,' replied the old man. "'I never has. It's a curious thing to me, sir.' "'What's the best way to make her go?' "'I spec, sir, that if I'd turn her round, she'd go the other way. "'But we want her to go this way.' "'Well, sir, I allow if we just set here for five minutes, she'll start up by herself.' "'All right,' I rejoined. "'It is cooler here than any place I have struck to-day. "'We'll let her stand for a while and see what she does.' "'We sat in silence for a few minutes.' when Julius suddenly ejaculated. "'Uh-huh! I knows why this mare don't go. It's dust flash cross my recommembrance. "'Why is it, Julius?' I inquired. "'Cause she sees Chloe.' "'Where is Chloe?' I demanded. "'Chloe's been dead these forty years and mo,' the old man returned. "'Her hate is settin' over yonder on the other side of the branch, under that willow tree this blessed minute. "'Why, Julius,' said my wife, "'do you see the haunt?' "'No, um, he answered, shaking his head. "'I don't see her, but the mare sees her.' "'How do you know?' I inquired. "'Well, sir, this here is a gray horse, "'and this here is a Friday, "'and a gray horse can allus see a haunt "'what walks on Friday.' "'Who is Chloe?' said Mabel. "'And why does Chloe's haunt walk?' asked my wife. "'It's all in detail, ma'am,' Julius replied with a deep sigh. "'It's all in detail.' "'Tell us the tale,' I said. "'Perhaps by the time you get through the haunt will go away and the mare will cross.' I was willing to humor the old man's fancy. He had not told us a story for some time, and the dark and solemn swamp around us, the amber-colored stream flowing silently and sluggishly at our feet, like the waters of Lethe, the heavy, aromatic scent of the bays, faintly suggestive of funeral wreaths, all made the place an ideal one for a ghost story. "'Chloe,' Julius began in a subdued tone, "'used to belong to old Ma's Dugal Makadu, my old master. She was a likely gal, and a smart gal, and old Miss took her up to the big house, and larned her to wait on the white folk.' till by and by she come to be the missus own maid and peered to low she run the house herself to hear her talk about it i was a young boy then and used to work about the stables so i knowed everything that was gwine on round the plantation well uh, one time mars dugu wanted the house boy and sought down to the quarters for to have jeff and hannibal come up to the big house next morning Old master and old miss looked the two boys over, and sussed with theirselves for a little while, and then Mars Dougal says, says he, 
We likes Hannibal de best, and we gwine to keep him. Here, Hannibal, you work at de house from now on, and if you are a good nigger and minds your business, I'll give you Chloe for a wife next spring. You other nigger, you Jeff, you can go back to de quarters. We ain't gwine to need you. Now Chloe had been standing there behind old Miss, doing all dis here talk, and Chloe made up her mind from the very first minute she set eyes on dem two, that she didn't like dat nigger Hannibal, and wouldn't never gwine to care for him, and she was dus as show that she liked Jeff, and was gwine to set stole by him, whether Mars Dougal took him in the big house or no. And so course Chloe was monster sorry when old Mars Dougal took Hannibal and sought Jeff back. So she slipped round the house and waylaid Jeff on the way back to the quarters, and told him not to be downheaded, for she was gwine to see if she couldn't find some way or nutter to get rid of that nigger Hannibal and get Jeff up to the house in his place. The new house boy caught on monstrous fast, and it wasn't no time hardly before Mars Dougal and Ole Miss both meant to allow Hannibal was the best house boy they ever had. He was pert and supple and quick as lightning and sharp as a razor, but Chloe didn't like his ways. He was so sure he was gwine to get her in the spring that he didn't appear to allow he had to do no coatin', and when he'd run cross Chloe about the house, He'd swell round her in a biggity way and say, Come here and kiss me, honey. You gwine to be mine in the spring. You don't appear to be as fond of me as you ought to be. Chloe didn't care nothing for Hannibal, and hadn't cared nothing for him, and she sought just as much stole by Jeff as she did the day she first laid eyes on him. And the more familiars dis yar cannibal got, the more Chloe let her mind run on Jeff and one evening she went down to the quarters and watched till she got a chance for to talk with him by hisself. And she told Jeff for to go down and see old Aunt Peggy, the conjure woman, down by the Wilmington Road, and ax her to give him something to help get Hannibal out in the big house so the white folks had sent for Jeff again. And being as Jeff didn't have nothing to give Aunt Peggy, Chloe gun him a silver dollar and a silk handkerchief for to pay her with, for Aunt Peggy never liked to work for nobody for nothing. So Jeff slipped down to Aunt Peggy's one night, and gun her the present he brung, and told her all about him and Chloe and Hannibal, and asked her to help him out. Aunt Peggy told him she'd work the roots, and for him to come back the next night, and she'd tell him what she could do for him. So the next night Jeff went back, and Aunt Peggy gun him a baby doll, with a body made out in a piece of corn stalk, and with splinters formed legs, and a head made out in elderberry peth, and two little red peppers for feet. This here baby doll, says she, is Hannibal. This here peth head is Hannibal's head, and these here pepper feet is Hannibal's feet. You take this and hide it under the house on the sill under the door where Hannibal have to walk over it every day. And as long as Hannibal comes anywhere nigh this baby doll, he'll be just like it is, light-headed and hot-footed. And if them two things don't get him into trouble mighty soon, then I'm no conjure woman. But when you get Hannibal out in the house and get all true with this baby doll, you must fetch it back to me, for oh, it's monstrous powerful goopher, and it's liable to make more trouble if you leave it laying round. Well, Jeff took the baby doll and slip up to the big house and whistled to Chloe, and when she come out, he told her what old Aunt Peggy had said, and Chloe showed him how to get under the house, and when he had put the conjure doll on the sill, he went long back to the quarters and just waited. Next day, sure enough, the gopher meant to work. Hannibal started in the house soon in the morning with an armful of wood to make a fire, and he had no more getting across the dough sill 
before his feet begun to burn so that he dropped the armful of wood on the floor and woke old miss up a hour sooner than usual and course an old miss didn't like that and spoke sharp about it when dinner time come on and Annabel was helping to cook carry the dinner from the kitchen into the big house and was getting close to the door where he had to go in his feet started to burn and his head begun to swim and he let the big dish of chicken and dumplings fall right down in the dirt in the middle of the yard and the white folks had to make their dinner that day off in cold ham and sweetened taters the next morning he overslept himself and got into more trouble at a breakfast mars dougal sent him over to mars marlboro utley's for to borrow a monkey wrench he ought to be back in half an hour but he come poking home by dinner time with a screwdriver stead of a monkey wrench mars dougal sent another nigger back with the screwdriver and hannibal didn't get no dinner long in the afternoon old miss sought hannibal to weedin the flowers in the front garden and hannibal dug up all the bulbs old miss had sot away fer and paid a lot of money fer and took em down to the hog pen by the barnyard and fed em to the hogs when old miss come out in the cool of the evening and seed what hannibal had done <laughs> she was most crazy and she wrote a note and sent hannibal down to the overseer with it but what hannibal got from the overseer didn't appear to do no good every now and then his feet had meant to torment him and his mind to get all mixed up and his conducts kept getting wusser and wusser till finally the white folks couldn't stand it no longer and mars dougal took hannibal back down to the quarters mr smith says mars dougal to the overseer this here nigger has done got so trifling lately that we can't keep him at the house no more and i'll fetch him to you to be straightened up you's had occasion to deal with him once so he knows what to speck you just take him in hand and let me know how he turns out and when the hands come in from the field this evening you can send that yellow nigger jeff up to the house i'll try him and see if he's any better than hannibal so jeff went up to the big house and please mars dougal and old miss and the rest of the family so well that they all got to liking him fust rate and they'd all forgot about hannibal if it hadn't been for the bad reports what come up from the quarters about him for a month or so fact is that chloe and jeff was so entrusted in one another since jeff being up to the big house that they forgot all about taking the baby doll back to aunt peggy and it kept working for a while and making hannibal's feet burn more or less till all the folks on the plantation got to calling him hot foot hannibal he kept getting mo and mo trifling till he got the name of being the most no counts nigger on the plantation and mars dougal had to threaten to sell him in the spring when by and by the gopher quit working and hannibal meant to pick up some and make folks set a little mo stole by him now this here hannibal was a monstrous smart nigger and when he got rid of them soul feet his mind kept running on his other troubles here three or four weeks before he'd had a easy job waiting on the white folks living off the fat of the land and promised the finest gal on the plantation for a wife in the spring and now here he was back in the cornfield with the overseer a cussin and a rarin if he didn't get a hard task done but nothing but corn bread and bacon and molasses to eat and all the field hands making remarks and pokin fun at him cause he'd been sought back from the big house to the field and the mo hannibal studied about it the mo madder he got till he finally swore he was gwine to get even with jeff and chloe if it was the last act so hannibal slipped away from the quarters one sunday and hid in the corn up close to the big house till he see chloe gwine down the road he waylay her and says he howdy chloe i ain't got no time for the fool with field hands says chloe tossing her head what you want with me hot foot i wants to know how you and jeff is getting along i allows that's none o your business nigger 
I don't see what occasion any common field hand has got to mix it with the fares of folks what lives in the big house. And if it'll do you any good to know, I might say that me and Jeff is getting along mighty well, and we gwine to get married in the spring, and you ain't gwine to be invited to the wedding, nother. No, no, says he. I wouldn't spect to be invited to the wedding, a common low-down field hand like I is. But I was glad to hear you and Jeff is getting along so well. I didn't know but what he had meant to be a little tired. Tired of me? That's ridiculous, says Chloe. Why, that nigger loves me, so I believe he'd go through fire and water for me. That nigger is just wrap up in me. Uh-huh, says Hannibal. Uh, then I reckon it must be some other nigger what meets a woman down by the crick in the swamp every Sunday evening to say nothing but two or three times a week. Yes, it is another nigger, and you is a liar when you say it was Jeff. Maybe I is a liar, and maybe I ain't got good eyes, but lessen I is a liar, and lessen I ain't got good eyes. Jeff is gwine to meet that woman dis evening, long about eight o'clock, right down there by the crick in the swamp, about halfway betwixt this plantation and Mars Marabo Utley's. Well, Chloe told Hannibal she didn't believe a word he said, and call him a low-down nigger who was trying to slander Jeff, cause he was more luckier than he was. But all the same, she couldn't keep her mind from running on what Hannibal had said. She remembered she'd heard one of the niggers say they was a gal over at Mars Marabo Utley's plantation, what Jeff used to go with some before he got acquainted with Chloe. Then she meant to figure back, and sure enough, there was two or three times in the last week when she'd been helping the ladies with their dressing and other fixings in the evening, and Jeff might have gone down to the swamp without her knowing about it at all. And then she meant to remember little things what she hadn't took no notice of before, and what'd make it appear like Jeff had something on his mind. Chloe set a monstrous heap of stole by Jeff, and would have done most anything for him as long as he stuck to her. But Chloe was a mighty jealous woman, and while she didn't believe what Hannibal said, she seed how it could have been so, and she determined for to find out for herself whether it was so or no. Now Chloe hadn't seed Jeff all day, for Mars Dougal had sent Jeff over to his daughter's house, young Miss Margaret's, what lived about four miles from Mars Dougal's, and Jeff was inspected home till evening. But thus at a supper was over, and whilst the ladies were setting out on the piazza, Chloe slipped off from the house and run down the road, this year same road we come. And when she got most to the crick, uh, this year same crick right before us, she kind of kept in the bushes at the side of the road, till finally she seed Jeff sitting on the bank on the other side of the crick, right under that old willow tree drooping over the water yonder. And every now and then he'd get up and look up the road towards Mars Marabos on the other side of the swamp. First, Chloe felt like she'd go right over the crick and give Jeff a piece of her mind. Then she allowed she better be sure before she done anything. So she held herself in the best she could, getting madder and madder every minute, till by and by she seed a woman coming down the road on the other side from towards Mars Marabo Utley's plantation. And when she see Jeff jump up and run towards that woman and throw his arms round her neck, poor Chloe didn't stop to see no more, but just turn round and run up to the house and rush up to the piazza and up and told Mars Dougal and Ole Miss all about the baby doll and all about Jeff getting the gopher from Aunt Peggy and about what that gopher had done to Hannibal. Mars Duga was monstrous mad. He didn't let on at first like he believed Chloe, but when she took and showed him where to find the baby doll, 
Mars Dougal turned white as chalk. "'What devil's work is dis?' says he. "'No wonder de po' nigger's feet etched. "'Something got to be done to learn dat old witch "'to keep her hands off in my niggers. "'And as for dis yer Jeff, "'I gwine to do dis what I promise, "'so de darkies on dis plantation will know I means what I says.' For Mars Dougal had warned the hands before about fooling with conjation. Fact, he had lost one or two niggers hisself from de being gophered, and he would have had old Aunt Peggy whip long ago, only Aunt Peggy was a free woman, and he was feared that she'd conjure him. And whilst Mars Dougal say he didn't believe in conjuring and such, he appeared to allow it was best to be on the safe side and let Aunt Peggy alone. So Mars Dougal done dus as he say. If old Miss had pleaded for Jeff, he might have kept him. But old Miss hadn't got over losing them bulbs yet, and she never said a word. Mars Dougal took Jeff to town next day and sold him to a speculator, who started down the river with him next morning on a steamboat for to take him to Alabama. Now. When Chloe told old Mars Dougal about dis yer baby doll and dis other gopher, she hadn't hardly allowed Mars Dougal would sell Jeff down south. Howsomever, she was so mad with Jeff that she swayed herself she didn't care. And so she held her head up and went round looking like she was real glad about it. But one day she was walking down the road when who should come along but this yer Hannibal? When Hannibal seed her, he bust out laughing fit for to kill. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh, hold me, honey, hold me, or I laugh myself to death. I ain't never laughed so much since I been born. What you laughing at, hot foot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I laughing at? Why? I's laughing at myself to be show, sure. laughing to think at what a fine woman I made. Chloe turned pale, and her heart come up in her mouth. What you mean, nigger? says she, catching hold of a bush by the road for to steady herself. What you mean by the kind of woman you made? What do I mean? <laughs> Ah, uh, means that I got squared up with you for treating me the way you done, and I got even with that yaller nigger Jeff for cutting me out. Now he gwine to know what it is to eat corn bread and molasses once more, and work from daylight to dark, and to have a overseer driving him from one day's end to the other. Ah, uh, means that I sought word to Jeff that Sunday that you was gwine to be over to Mars Marabo's visitin' that evening, and you want him to meet you down by the creek on the way home and go the rest of the road with you. <laughs> and then I put on a frock and a sunbonnet and fix myself up to look like a woman. And when Jeff seed me comin', he run to meet me, and you seed him for I been watching in the bushes before and skivered you coming down the road. And now I reckon you and Jeff both know what it means to mess with a nigger like me. Oh, Chloe, hadn't heard more than half of the last part of what Hannibal said, but she had heard enough to learn that this nigger had fooled her and Jeff, and that poor Jeff had done nothing and that for loving her too much and going to meet her she had caused him to be sold away where she'd never never see him no more the sun might shine by day the moon by night the flowers might bloom and the mocking birds might sing but poor jeff was done lost to her for ever and for ever hannibal hadn't more than finished what he had to say when Chloe's knees gun way under her, and she fell down in the road, and lay there half an hour or so before she come to. When she did, she crept up to the house just as pale as a ghost. And for a month or so she crawled round the house, and appeared to be so poorly that Mars Dougal sent for a doctor, 
and the doctor kept on asking her questions till he found out she was just pining away for Jeff. When he told Mars Dougal, Mars Dougal laughed, and he said he'd fix that. She could have the new house boy for her husband, but old Miss say no, Chloe ain't that kind of gal, and that Mars Dougal should buy Jeff back. So Mars Dougal writ a letter to this yer speculator down to Wilmington, and told if he ain't done sold that nigger south what he'd brought from him, he'd like to buy him back again. Chloe meant to pick up a little when old Miss told her about this letter. Howsomever, by and by, Mars Dougal got an answer from the speculator, who said he was monster sorry, but Jeff had fell overboard or jumped off the steamboat on the way to Wilmington, and got drowned. And, course, he couldn't sell him back, much as he liked to bleach Mars Dougal. Well, out of Chloe heard this, she wasn't much more used to nobody. She pretended to do her work, and old Miss put up with her, and had the doctor give her medicine and let her go to the circus and all sorts of things for to take her mind off her troubles. But they didn't none of em do no good. Chloe got to slipping down here in the evening, just like she was coming to meet Jeff, and she sat there under that willow tree on the other side and wait for him, night at a night. By and by she got so bad, the white folks sent her over to young Miss Boggess for to give her a change, but she runned away the first night, and when they looked for her next morning, they found her corpse laying in the branch yonder, right cross from where we're sitting now. Ever since then, said Julius in conclusion, Chloe's haunt comes every evening and sets down under that willow tree and waits for Jeff, and he walks up and down the road yonder, looking and looking and waiting and waiting for her sweetheart what ain't never, never coming back to her no more. There was silence when the old man had finished, and I am sure I saw a tear in my wife's eye, and more than one in Mabel's. I think, Julius, said my wife after a moment, that you may turn the mare around and go by the long road. The old man obeyed with alacrity, and I noticed no reluctance on the mare's part. "'You are not afraid of Chloe's heart, are you?' I asked jocularly. My mood was not responded to, and neither of the ladies smiled. "'Oh, no,' said Annie, "'but I've changed my mind. I prefer the other route.' When we had reached the main road, and had proceeded along it for a short distance, we met a cart driven by a young negro, and on the cart were a trunk and a valise. We recognized the man as Malcolm Murchison's servant, and drew up a moment to speak to him. "'Who's going away, Marshal?' I inquired. "'Young Master Malcolm, gwine we on de boat to New York this evening, sir, and I'm taking his things down to the wharf, sir.' This was news to me, and I heard it with regret. My wife looked sorry, too, and I could see that Mabel was trying hard to hide her concern. "'He's coming along behind, sir, and I spec you'll meet him up the road a piece. He's going to walk down as far as Master Jim Williams, and take the buggy from there to town. He specs to be gone a long time, sir, and say probably he ain't never coming back.' The man drove on. There were few words exchanged in, a, in an undertone between my wife and Mabel, which I did not catch. Then Annie said, "'Julius, you may stop the rock away a moment. There are some trumpet flowers by the road there that I want. Will you get them for me, John?' I sprang into the underbrush, and soon returned with a great bunch of scarlet blossoms. "'Where is Mabel?' I asked, noting her absence. She has walked on ahead. We shall overtake her in a few minutes. The carriage had gone only a short distance when my wife discovered that she had dropped her fan. I had it where we were stopping, Julius. Will you go back and get it for me? Julius got down and went back for the fan. He was an unconsciously long time finding it. After we got started again, we had gone only a little way, when we saw Mabel and young Murchison coming toward us. They were walking arm in arm, 
and their faces were aglow with the light of love. I do not know whether or not Julius had a previous understanding with Malcolm Murchison by which he was to drive us round by the long road that day, nor do I know exactly what motive influenced the old man's exertions in the matter. He was fond of Mabel, but I was old enough and knew Julius well enough to be skeptical of his motives. It is certain that a most excellent understanding existed between him and Murchison after the reconciliation and that when the young people set up housekeeping over at the old Murchison place, Julius had an opportunity to enter their service. For some reason or other, however, he preferred to remain with us. The mare, I might add, was never known to balk again. End of Hot Foot Hannibal Recording by Phil Chenevere